You know, I really enjoy making things. I mean, I'm a big DIY project sort of guy. Uh, although around the whole house, I, I'm never getting enough done to get caught up on my honey-do list, but that's a whole other issue. But I, I like making things that they work, right? I mean, my favorite sort of do-it-yourself project is woodworking, and people like to do woodworking for a variety of reasons. Uh, but there's two things that really make it enjoyable for me. Um, the first thing is, uh, well, I, I enjoy making things that they just fit perfectly into a space or they, they meet a particular need that our family has in a way that something off the shelf never could. I mean, I, I don't want to just take a set of blueprints or plans and, and make something that someone else has already made a hundred times over. I want to take the ideas from those projects and adjust them so that it's the perfect fit for that free space in our house or a particular need that, that someone has. And that just, it brings me so much joy to see that happen. The second thing that I really enjoy with woodworking, I like to take something old and I like to make it new. Not just make it, restore it or that sort of thing, but I like to take something that was something and make it into something completely different. Now, the previous owners of our house, they were all pretty handy um, over the years. And it was really great for me because the garage already had some really solid workbenches. They were built well. But over the years, they've had more than a few layers of paint that's been added and, and all sorts of features that have been added for purposes that I, I still haven't figured out. Uh, through the pandemic, though, I've been working more from home, like a lot of us have, and my main workbench in the garage has also become the desk where I study and I do paperwork, and I even make uh, video calls from there to connect with excellent people like you who are a part of the Grace Point Community Church family. So this space where my main workbench is, I really need not a workbench, but a desk that can kind of be a workbench too. But Rather than just adding something else to the workbench, at this point, I, I really need something that's completely new, something that's different. And so the thing is, I, I love the, the top of the workbench is made out of some, some wood that I really like. It's got this beautiful grain and, and even the stains and the weathering of the boards, it just adds to the character. And, and it would be a lot easier, honestly, to just throw the whole thing out because I know that as soon as I start pulling nails out, I know that these boards are gonna be twisted, they're, they're gonna be full of holes, and, and the sides are still covered in layers of old paint and dirt, even after scrubbing it down. I mean, some of this stuff just will not come off. But I like them. I really want those boards to be the surface that I'm working on, and so I'm gonna take the time to, to take them apart clean them up, I'm going to be able to remove some of the dents, fill in the holes where I have to, and then put them back together uh, so that the boards are working together to keep one another straightened out again. And, and I'm really looking forward to the, the process and not just the end result. But it's going to be something completely unlike what I started with. It's going to be somewhere where I can actually do the work that I need to do. I can do, do, use it as a desk and a workbench, and I'm, I'm really excited about that. Now, you may know that when Jesus was born, his earthly father, Joseph, he was a bit of a craftsman. The Bible doesn't give us a lot of details about the sort of the work that Jesus would have done with his father, Joseph, but it does give us a lot of details about the sort of building that Jesus does with God, the Father. That's right, God is also a craftsman. And so today in 1 Peter, we're going to be taking a look at a very different sort of building. 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 10. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, 
the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So Peter here is painting this picture of the church being very similar to that new workbench slash desk that I need. Now you see my, my old workbench, the, the drawers are broken, the surfaces are dirty, and, and even after I've tried to scrub it down, there's just years of automotive grease and everything else. And so if I try to build something on my workbench, it, it gets dirty just in trying to build it. Now, if we work backwards through from the end of this passage here that we just read, there's three big questions that come to mind. Uh, the last one, what is the purpose that God is building so differently for? Then how is he going to put this new structure together? And the first question that Peter is really going to answer for us is, what is God building this structure out of? Well, if we start out in verse 1, he's building it out of newborns. Peter makes it quite clear who we are here. Without Jesus, before we started following Christ, we were full of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, slander. He's talking about these things in the present tense, too. So not only are these things that define the broken state that God found us in, but some of these things, we're still returning to them, even now that we've been set free from sin in Christ Jesus. Now, when I go to buy new lumber, I go to the store and I try to find the straightest pieces that I can. But when it comes to reusing lumber, or even just correcting problems in a structure, those changes have to be introduced gradually. One of two things is going to happen. If you try to force lumber into a position that it's not willing to take, it's going to snap either back to the way it was, or it's going to just plain out snap in two. Now in verses two and three, Peter, he gives us this, this gradual picture of our development as followers of Christ. He's comparing us to newborn infants, and we need to long for that spiritual milk, he tells us. We want to look for those little changes that God wants to make in our life and, and don't fight against him. Don't rush things either. I mean, we don't want to just go straight off to eating solid food. You, know, you give a, a child solid food too soon, they might choke, or at the very least, give you a face full of peas and broccoli. Not that I've ever experienced anything like that. But then in verses 4 through 6, Peter tells us that God is going to build this structure and the, the techniques that he's going to use. He's taking people who are defined by not very nice things at the beginning. Brokenness and sin is a good shorthand for that. But bit by bit, he's helping those people to grow up into salvation. Now, God's not going to build some sort of stick-built house that might last for 50 or even 100 years. He's got something way more permanent in mind. And so, he tells us that he's, he's taken this living stone that was rejected by men, and that's Jesus. Peter tells us that, that we're being brought to this living stone ourselves and that we are becoming like living stones. And together we're being built into a spiritual house. And that house is built on Jesus for the purpose that we might work with Jesus to offer a particular spiritual sacrifice that's acceptable to God. Now on our own, we're not capable of that. But as a part of this spiritual house, which is built on Christ... Now, our, our work with Christ, we can present His sacrifice, which is absolutely acceptable to God. Now, I don't know about you, but this sounds like a really good deal to me. Because I've seen God at work in my life. I've, I've seen that that spiritual milk can, can grow into salvation in my own life. And I've, I've seen it in the lives of those around me. It's good stuff. Now, I believe now because I, I know it's true. But not everyone believes, Peter tells us. Now, last week we were talking about this stumbling block that the sacrifice of Christ presents. 
But the entire purpose of this spiritual house, this building, that entire purpose has been called into question by the world around us. They look at the sacrifice of Christ that we're presenting to God, and they say, no, no, thank you. Peter says that the reason for this is that they are disobedient to God's word. And furthermore, he tells us that the reason that they're disobedient is because that's their destiny. Now, taken out of context, this can be really hurtful for those of us who are, are we're waiting for a loved one to choose to follow Jesus. And it can, it can get us into this us versus them sort of mentality that is really foreign to the scriptures. We can make the mistake of thinking that, well, I believe God, and therefore I'm chosen. But Susie Q over there, she hasn't believed because God didn't choose her. Now, you can only get to that point if you ignore everything that we've already read in 1 Peter. And you can go all the way back to Daniel to get this same idea. We're also going to have to ignore what we're talking about next. Because the purpose of this house is very different. God's building with a particular purpose. I want to tell you about a house that was not very far from where I grew up. Um, and it, it was different from all the other houses around it. Uh, because when they built the house, they added this uh, lookout type porch on the top of the house. And it meant that it was really easy to see this house even from a long ways away. And it was also really easy from this house to look out and to see people coming from a long ways away. And it, it made this house look very different and it made it a landmark because no one else built houses like this. So why did they build the house differently? Well, the rumor was that this house also had another unique feature that had been uh, lost to time and, and highway construction, but originally it had a tunnel that went from the basement of that house to another nearby house. And the purpose of that was that this house was actually a stop on the Underground Railroad. It was different and it was visible from a long ways away so that those who were fleeing the injustices of slavery in the American South would be able to find and identify this building as a safe space. It was built with a lookout and a hiding place so that owners of the home could see when someone needed rescue and they could see if there was someone coming who might intend harm to those who had already found refuge in this very different house. Now, God has not built us into this royal priesthood that Peter describes. He hasn't made us a, a people, a chosen race. He hasn't set us aside as Christ followers for his own possession without a purpose. We're not just supposed to sit around like a collection on a shelf or like so many boards laid up in a warehouse. We are being built into a spiritual house because God has a purpose. And that purpose is very similar to that house on the Underground Railroad. It's a house that needs to be identifiable for those who are looking re for refuge from the brokenness of this world. Now, as a priesthood, we have work to do. And that work is to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into this marvelous light. And we see that in verse 10, Peter reminds us we've received mercy. But that wasn't always the case. Now, you remember those people who were fulfilling their destiny by disobeying God's word? I used to be one of those people. And you either were one of those people or... Maybe you still are one of those people. You see, all of us were destined to disobedience. It's what we deserved. It's what we'd earned. Because of our sin. Because we were set against God. But Christ's sacrifice has transformed us. And now we're able to follow Jesus as his people. And we actually can present Christ's sacrifice to God. And just like the Old Testament priests were purified before they could represent the people, we've been purified in Christ, and now as living stones ourselves, we're able to proclaim God's mercy, to proclaim God's love, to proclaim God's hope for all those who were destined, like us, to disobedience. And now we can choose spiritual life. I hope you can see here that we're, we're looking at the blueprints, the ideals that God has laid down for the church. This is who we've been called to be, and yet oftentimes the church and, and Christians in general were rejected in the world, not because of the cross, 
Not because the world can't understand the sacrifice that Jesus has made. That certainly happens. But a lot of times, the church is being rejected because we are known for hypocrisy. We're known for those that we hate, for the, the power, the wealth, and prestige that we might crave. How many times have people been driven from the church because they were subject to gossip and slander? Peter says, put those things away. At Grace Point, as we look towards starting the church, we've talked a lot about how we're in the caterpillar phase. Now, as a church and as individuals, we're learning to crave that spiritual milk. We're learning how to put away those things that have become such an obstacle between those who stumble and the salvation that all of us need. There's three things that I want us to do together as a church, but as individuals. The first thing that we need to be able to do is to take an assessment and to continually ask God to show us where we are holding on to the old practices that Jesus has set us free from. Let's take time to consider what defines us as human beings. Let's compare that ideal that God has set for us to ourselves and understand where God is working on us to make us into living stones, to make, help us to become like Jesus. The second thing that I want us to do together, but as individuals, is to be honest with each other. When we fall short, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1 makes that clear. And at Grace Point Community Church, this isn't a place where we come to pretend that we're better than we really are. It's not a place where we come to put on a mask. It's a place where we come to support one another in obedience to the Word of God. Now, I know that a lot of us have been hurt in the past, either by people in a church or even by the organization that is called a local church. How far would it have moved us towards healing to have received a simple apology? What if honesty and integrity, those ideals meant that we take responsibility for our mistakes instead of pretending that we didn't make them. It isn't about assigning guilt or shame. It's about being honest about the high standards that God is building towards. And finally, we are a community and, and as individuals, we need to recognize that the purpose of this structure that God is building so differently, it's not to proclaim our own sacrifices. It is to proclaim the sacrifice of Christ. We can say honestly that God is not done with us yet. Not only as we talk to people within our church, but also when we present ourselves to the outside world as well. And then what's holding us back from proclaiming God's mercy, proclaiming the hope that God has, that he has given us this opportunity to share his love and his mercy. Medicine Hat is over 65,000 people who were at one point or another destined for disobedience. And those of us who have already received God's mercy, we have an obligation, a job to do, to proclaim to those who are still in darkness about the nature of God's mercy, that they too can receive mercy, they too can walk in that marvelous light. And we can certainly do that by serving others, even as Christ has served us. And we also do it through our words, by sharing the story that God has given us, about the work that God is doing in us. You know, I think back to my workbench, and, and the wood in that workbench, it's, it's so messed up. I mean, I, I couldn't even use it for firewood. But I do love those boards. I, I love the grain and the character. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to taking the extra time to, to transform each one of those boards so that they can work together, that they can have that new purpose. But I can see one of those boards already, it's, it's going to be particularly hard to work with. There's so much tension already that the board is, has twisted the nails that are holding it in place in my old workbench. You see, God's love for you runs so much deeper than my love for those pieces of wood. And his transformation is going to be so much more complete. Like a true craftsman, he's not interested in, in simply forcing us, bending us to his will. It's his desire to work with us 
And as we are willing to submit to his gentle instruction, as we crave that pure spiritual milk, we aren't just repaired, we're renewed. I want you this week to go in peace and obedience to the word of God, obedience to the life to which we have been called. Would you pray with me? God, give us your peace. More than that, though, give us obedience. Help us to walk in your ways. Help us to become, even as your son, a living stone with a particular purpose, Lord. You are building a spiritual house, Lord, and, and we ask for a place in that house that we too may be a part of presenting the sacrifice of Christ to you, that we too may be a part of proclaiming your mercy, proclaiming your majesty, proclaiming your excellence, Lord. Help us as we go through this week not to turn away from opportunities to share who you are as we live according to your word, as we speak according to your truth. In your name we pray. Amen.